My great granddad's name was uh, Inukini, and a uh, real funny thing. That means buffalo curly hair. Now, you look at Inukini and then you say my name and you think, where did she get that name? Buffalo curly hair, bruised head. Ugh. I don't know what those people were drinking that day when they were translating our Blackfoot names at Blackfoot <laughs> Crossing. Anyhow, that's my family name. And my family is from the um, uh, Fish Eater Clan, which is from the blood tribe, the Kanatapi, of the Blackfoot Nation. That's the uh, tears that, the, that, that the make up where I come from, who I am. So when, when people would come into my clan's camp, they knew what to look for to find out what clan I was from in the days of old. I always put myself back there. I, I should have been born back there. Uh, again, welcome to the Galt Museum and Archives. Welcome to Siksikaitsi Puyitapi's Voices, which means Blackfoot speaking people's voices. Again, going back to the Blackfoot people, their ways of life, Nichidapi Patapis, which actually means true people, true ways of living your life, Nichitapi Patapis, true people's ways of living life, all came from nature. You only had three things to work with, plants, animals, and minerals. This was all they had to work with. Like today, we go to this store and we buy whatever we need. We go to this other store, we buy. My ancestors went to nature. That was who looked after them, what looked after them, where they got looked after. There was a lot of um, moving your camp from one place to another and then another throughout the seasons. And in each season, you could move your camp maybe three, four times, only because you were following your food on the hoof, which was what? Yeah. 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 Buffalo. Buffalo was their main source of food. But in the springtime through to the late summer, they, they had their own natural, nature's garden. What vegetables do you think that they found in nature's garden? Huh? Vegetables. Not the, not the, the herbs, vegetables. There's seven. Come on, guys. Yep. Potatoes. Come on. Parsnip. It's a white, I call them a white carrot. No peppers, love. No peppers. Onions. Yes, my favorite. One starts with M, the other starts with T, and the other starts with C. Mushrooms. Mushrooms. Oh, who could live without mushrooms? Come on, two more. Turnip. Yes. One more. Starts with a C. Huh? Cabbage? Yeah! Cabbage? Turnip? We even have a hill on my reserve we call um, uh, uh, Turnip Hill. And when you go there, you can find turnips, wild turnips. Uh, carrots? Mistikapas. Potato? Mataki. Uh, onion, uh, huh? Mat, um, onion, uh, 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 parsnip, I have never learned. I called it, uh, uh, up, uh, up, uh, up, uh, up, uh, ah, now I can't say it. Uh, white carrot, that's what I call it. I never asked, silly me, I never asked an elder, how do you call these in our language? And of course, mushrooms, uh, uh, that's what you call them, stars. 
We call them stars because uh, the, 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 the stars fall. And that's what, what you, you get from the sky. From the sky people is mushrooms. Cool, eh? <laughs> yeah. So those were the, the, and they only had them for a certain few months of each year. Uh, today, when I go into a grocery store, when I c could still really see good, I, I, I'd walk into the produce and I'd look at all those colors. And, oh my gosh, if my ancestors from even just 500 years ago walked in here, they would say, oh my goodness, where did these delicious looking things come from? Because uh, in the days of old, it was just those seven major main uh, vegetables. There were roots and there were uh, um, herbs that they used to preserve, to, to, to enhance, and they used them as medicine as well and for uh, ceremonial purposes. Uh, these people knew if a, bird, if a flock of birds did something, they knew something was up. They could talk with nature. That's how intricate they were with nature and how intricate nature was with them. And um, they, um, they were so open of spirit, of mind, and of, of, of body that nature itself talked with them and they talked with nature. They didn't go out and kill a bunch of eagles for their feathers or a bunch of porcupines for their quills or their hair. They would capture them and, use, and then take what they need, harvest from that animal, and then actually look after that animal and then let it go. I, as a little girl, my great-grandmother would call my, my Blackfoot name. Slow Walker is my Blackfoot name. Uh, go get me some porcupine hair. Okay. I'd go home. My dad had gotten me this long stick and he had a Y at the end of it. I'd get my tool, my Y stick, and another long stick with an old cloth at the end of it. And off I'd go into the woods, look for the uh, porcupines. Do you know where the best place to find porc porcupines at, boys and girls, ladies? Yes. Where? Um, in trees. In trees, yeah. Yeah, they climb. Boy, they can climb. On the ground, they look so funny. They go, boom, 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 boom. And they're trying to run. And the harder they try to run, they, all they do is go back and forth like that. <laughs> and have you ever had a porcupine scold you? They grunt. They hiss at you. They growl at you. And they chatter their teeth at you, clicking their teeth. Oh, they really, really scold you. And they wave their tail around. Come near me. I will use this on you. Anyways, I'd get them down off the tree, and then I would put the Y stick just behind their head and hold their head down, take the other stick with the long, with the uh, old rag on it, and rub them from tail to head over and over and over again until that cloth was filled with their porcupine quilts. Then I'd give them... Um, a, a teaspoonful of salt. I'd put the salt on the ground and get away from them. Mm -hmm. They'd scold me and all, and then they'd realize, oh, I got myself a treat. They love salt. <laughs> so I'd take the rag back home and sit there and pull the porcupines through. Once I got a porcupine quill in my finger. I will never forget that. At six, seven, eight years old, I, about six, five, six, seven years old, I will never forget that porcupine quill in my finger. I cried for two weeks. Oh, it hurt. And uh, so I was always very careful. These are the ways that the people in the days of old lived with nature. 
in nature, because of nature. Nature is good to them. Nature is cruel to them. Nature is harsh on them. But they learn to survive and to thrive. Then the European immigrants started coming in and they saw this land was pristine, uninhabited. Earlier on I mentioned that even in one season they would move their camps three, four times maybe. They never took up an area and just kill off whatever was there, bury it under whatever. They would live in that campsite several weeks and then move again because they had to keep up with their food on the hoof. And that's why a lot of history books called my people nomadic. It applies to, in a certain way. But when you stop and think about it, when you got a 2,000 pound roast beef, um, sirloin steak walking away from you, you're going to follow it. You're not going to let it go you know, too far so you can't catch up to your, your food. In the days of old, that's how they, they moved, was the food on the, on, on the hoof. Then, in the fall, before the, the female buffalo and this year's uh, calf crop, the new, the new buffalo babies, and last year's uh, calf crop, before they migrated southward to warmer weather, they would have a large buffalo hunt. How many of you have been to head smashed in buffalo jump. How many? Ah, good for you. So you have a, an idea of the large buffalo hunt. People, my people would come all from all, all points to, to an area just along the river to the south of um, the buffalo jump where uh, hundreds of TP rings were found over the last 50 years by archaeologists. <clears throat> and then the young people, like you, you, you young ladies, Rebecca here, Mike and Josh, they would have a special camp right at the foot of the jump site itself. That was called the butchering camp. Then they would go up into the hills there, and the young young uh, children, 14, 15, 16 year old, what we call our teenagers today, they would don on uh, wolf hides, coyote hides, cougar hides, bear hides, and they would mimic the sound of a, um, and one of them would, or a few of them would have uh, baby buffalo hides on their, on, as a disguise, and they would make the sounds of a buffalo calf in distress. And the mama buffaloes would just naturally uh, walk towards the, the, the calf's distressed uh, calls. And the, the other uh, disguised people would be like harassing that baby calf, that baby buffalo calf. So the mamas would follow you know, as long as they weren't attacking the baby, they would just follow along. And that's how they lured, my people lured large uh, herds of buffalo to the, towards the edge of the, uh, the jump site. No one chases buffalo today. <laughs> if you try to chase buffalo, watch out. They'll turn on a dime and come after you and you be the chased one, you know. <laughs> Uh, so if, if, if you're a real fast climber, good for you. Or if you're a, and they can run at between 65 and 68 miles an hour. How many of us can run that fast? <laughs> Not me. I don't think I can make 68 inches in like two, <laughs> two minutes. I'd be <laughs> like that. I'd be a, what do you call a buffalo? Buffalo, what do you call those? A curb? Oh, uh, uh, what Speed do you call bump. Speed bump. Yeah, that's what I'd be. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, these guys knew how to lure the buffalo towards, uh, constantly towards the, um, towards the um, uh, edge of the, the, the jump site. And then the others hiding, like buffalo are like me. I must be related to them. I can't see very good. 
uh, they don't see very, they can see motion and whatnot, but they would, um, the other native people would be up in the, just hidden behind the cairns, uh, the piles of rock, and they'd have uh, animal skins blowing in the wind so that the buffalo would see that motion and stay down on the valley floor, stay together, and then they would uh, lure them as close to the, to the um, cliffside, uh, and then the rest of them would come down waving um, buffalo uh, uh, animal skins and hollering and what, and then the buffalo would stampede. That lead cow would just take off, probably straight for the cliff at edge, before she could signal the group of buffalo behind them, behind her, they'd be going over the edge. That's how they would uh, get up to 200, 500 head. The higher the buffalo jump, the more they would, uh, they would. And then these would be distributed to the butchering camp, the, 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 peop the young people. Women uh, with their obsidian knives go, you had a fillet piece of buffalo meat. They were fast. Then they would take them, they would smoke them and package them, preserve them, and then after the buffalo hunt was done and the other celebrations were, were done, uh, then they would all go back to their, to their wintering camps. And where do you think that my people would camp during the winter? You got the forest in, along all river bank, all rivers, river valleys, you have the forest so you get your firewood. Because you can't really um, collect uh, buffalo patties to store for your winter use. In the summer, that was the best fuel on the, on the plains was uh, buffalo patties. They burn for a long time and they cook everything. Don't ever burn manure because it just burns and burns and burns and burns. It's, it's really hard to put out. Believe you me, we lost all our tack one year because my uncle decided, one of my uncles decided, I'm going to clean the yard and started a, a, a debris fire right next to the tack room where, there, where we actually parked the horses, saddled them up, harnessed them up, and they would drop their manure there and it would dry. I don't know how many feet of uh, manure was there. And that burned for like weeks. My poor uncle, he, he could never get over losing eight, ten dozen saddles, four, five, six full sets of harness. Halters, you name it, we lost everything. <laughs> but I was only trying to clean the yard, he told my grandpa. <laughs> Poor guy. These people, my ancestors, like I said, spoke to nature. Nature spoke to them. If a flock of birds did something, they knew good or bad was coming. They didn't get burnt out when the lightning would hit the prairie grass and prairie fires would catch. Would, 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 uh, you know, today we call it devastation, but in those days that was uh, a renewal of everything. We never looked at it as destruction. We always looked at it as a renewal. Because in the spring, guess what? That burnt out area from last fall, brand new, brand new grass, and it would lure the buffalo to, towards your, closer to your camp. So that's where they would camp come spring and early summer because the buffalo would go for that green, fresh grass. So they were, oh my gosh. When I stop and think about them, I, I think that's, I know that's one of the main reasons why I just, ah, I cannot believe how so intelligent and they could read the cosmos. They could read the university. They, they, they knew what kind of structures to use because that was what nature showed them. When we make things today, we make them big and shiny and blunt and, ugh. But when you stop and think about it and you redo that, that item and you, it looks like like um, like uh, like some something and some creature in nature, right? The airplanes, when they fly overhead, I feel like I'm laying on the bottom of the seafloor watching the shark go over me. 
Only that thing makes a lot of noise. A shark will sneak up on you. When, before the 1600s, my ancestors used a certain creature as a beast of burden. What creature was that, guys and gals? No, you can't use that. No. Yeah. What kind of dogs? Wolves. Wolves, yes. Children would go to the wolf dens and take the puppies out of there and bring them to their camps and play with them and tame them. And then they'd be used as beasts of burden. After the 1600s, 1630, 1631, this young group of young men came from way down south. They had gone on a, what I call a fact-finding tour. They called it, in the books, they called them raids. And they brought this creature home. We didn't even have a name for it, you know. Like, we, we can name anything, everything in nature, but this creature that was brought in was introduced in the 1600s. We didn't even have a, a, a Blackfoot word for it. The oldsters were sitting around looking at the, this creature. They were parading it around, parading it around. Huh? And the young men were telling their, their camp. When, those, when, when we were spying on those that camp from way down what we'll call uh, New Mexico area. There was a camp there of um, um, Arapahoes, let's call it that way. And we were watching them from, from uh, cover. They ride this horse. They ride this creature. They ride this creature. And when they move... The, the creature, one creature takes the whole teepee, everything, the bedding, the whole nine yards on a travois. One creature moves a whole household. Let's use that teepee hole. There you go. <laughs> so so uh, they, they couldn't figure out what, what kind of a creature is this? And, and they, they noticed that it had a solid hoof. It wasn't split hoof, it was a solid. But curiosity got the cat. They killed that creature and ate it and found out horse meat is not worth eating. <laughs> you know? So they, when the next creature was brought in, they gave it a name. It's the size of an elk, and it did the work of the, their wolf dogs. So we used the two... Blackfoot names of the elk and the wolf dog to name what we call today the horse, what the English language uh, uh, calls this creature the horse. We call it Punuka, Punuka Mita, Punuka Elk Imita Dog, Punuka Mita. That's our name for the, for the, Horse, our language will give you a look at nature, a creature in nature, an event in nature. It is describing and it is descriptive. It does not leave anything to your imagination because when you speak the language and you understand it, you don't ask questions like, what, the, what color was it? Um... What shape was it? You don't need to ask those questions because the language will describe uh, in the words that you use when you're speaking the language, it will describe. So, ponokomita. Can you guys say that after me? And what is that? Elk, elk dog equals horse. Huh? That's what we called it. Now, this is my namesake, well, at least my great-granddaddy's name, namesake. What is it in Blackfoot? Ene. Ene. Somebody was listening. Cool. Awesome. Ene. And this creature saved my, my ancestors. 
thousands of years ago. This creature, yeah, I know. This creature uh, saw, we, we didn't hunt the buffalo thousands and thousands of years ago. When what we were living off of nature was not sustaining us, so people were dying, starving, and whatnot. Grandfather Buffalo sat down, had a parley, a powwow with the Creator, and he told the Creator, I offer my, myself and my kin for these people to use as a source of food, a source of uh, home, tools, you name it. They cannot waste one part from here to here. They cannot waste any of us, any parts of us. That's the condition. So that's where the word contract comes from. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the creators thought about it. Oh, that's a really good deal. So that's when my people started hunting the buffalo for their food. They do not waste. They did not waste. Not the organs, uh, not even the what was in the intestines, in the, any one of the four stomachs, they were used as um, fuel uh, to disguise odors. Like these people knew how to utilize this creature from the tip of its nose to the end of its tail. You know, uh, if you, when you leave here, uh, George, he's standing out here on that platform there. Take a good look at his tail. That was a, the best fly swatter you could get. Because you could sit there and just whip yourself gently with his tail. And no flies would come near you. Because when they're out in the, in the, in the open area, the buffalo are wagging their tail, keep shooing the flies away, right? You watch horses and cattle today. They do the same thing. But the buffalo's tail is the best fly swatter in the world. Best fly shoer, shoer away in the world. They used everything on this creature. Even the eyeballs were c collected and the liquid from inside of the eyeballs was used to whiten um, buck skin, animal skin to a nice white color, well, lack of color. Because normally this is the color that they are when they're done, this is, this is usually the color. Once they're smoked, they're, they're this color. So with the liquid from the brain, liquid from the eyes, and the acid from the liver, you get this white, nice white buckskin. And my people were known for white buckskin. People from other tribes you know, come from many air, uh, distance, uh, distant miles to trade for this white buckskin, you know. And uh, so the buffalo gave itself to the people for food uh, on the condition that he was not to be wasted. Today, oh my gosh, how many uh, landfills are uh, 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 the waste that we, we human beings, uh, uh, oh, this is, it's got a hole in it, throw it away. Um, this was yesterday's dinner. Throw it away. Uh, we are the silliest creatures walking this earth. We, the two-legged human beings. If you look at your space, when you go home today, look at your space. How could I prolong the use of this one item? It's not you working this way. What can I use it for? What else can I use it for? And that's the way the people lived. That's why when the early immigrants came, they thought nobody lived in, in, in this area. They thought it was uninhabited. And yet, that area was just used by the, the people then to, um, to, have, to set up a camp. When would, do you think you would need to leave the river bottom camp. Clouds, cracking of the iceberg. There you go. Give that lady a 
go, go star. The crackling of the ice, the buckling. Oh, it's it's thaw time. They pack up their their uh, camp and go up to higher ground. And if there was a rainstorm, a thunderstorm, and lightning started a prairie fire, what do you think? How do you think a fi um, prairie fire ten miles from from their camp? How would they be notified in the rainstorm? Because they'll be inside their um, teepees out of the rain. Bird? Yep. What else? Uh, the sound of the fire. No, in the rain. Smell could be one, yeah, but if the wind was not in towards their camp, what do you think would alert them to, you know, get out of the way? Smoke. Yeah. Rabbits. Uh, 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 bugs. Uh, gophers. Bugs. They'd be running for, for, in, for, from away from in front of the, 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 the fire. And then they would just quickly pack up and, and, um, and you know what, ladies... Not to put the men down. The job of the camp takedown in the camp um, uh, setting up was the ladies. And they could do it like just fast. They were quick. Can you take a TP down today? No. We need those really burly, muscled, uh, hard-working guys to... Help us to pack up and, and haul us out. The differences, eh? I, I moved a few times in my life. My two sons told me, pack it up, mom. Remember, your great grandmother, she packed up her own camp, her own household. And, and then she loaded it up on the travois. We'll just load it up for you in the truck. So I got the fun part of packing up. I got to the point where I said, geez. I'd be silly to try want to want to move again because I don't like packing up. It's hard work. Guys and gals, any questions? And I mean any questions. Uh, the question is, uh, how many times would the First Nation people move in the, year, in the days of old? And the answer is as few as four, as many as 20, maybe even more. Depending on what nature was doing for them. And then they would need to get to certain parts of their, their cycle. Their spring to late fall, early spring to late fall cycle. Before they had to settle in the river bottom for the winter. Between the buffalo, the last buffalo hunt and the, 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 the first uh, snowfall, they would uh, need to, um, uh, they, they would need to pick, like their harvest their, their roots that they needed. And they wouldn't take two, three tons of the same thing like we do today. Sugar beets, corn, squash, um, pumpkins, you get them by the truckload. In the days of old, they didn't do that. They took what they needed using uh, plants, herbs to preserve them and store them in their uh, stomach, their buffalo stomach bags. Like we, we've got the, uh, what are some of the high-end uh, suitcases nowadays? The names. There you go. Their Samsonite back then was buffalo stomachs, buffalo uh, bladders, buffalo uh, scrotums, uh, deer, elk, uh, bladders, and whatnot. Their wallets were probably, today we call them um, wallets and purses. Well, here's a wallet and here's a purse in the days of old. And it's just animal hide. This is the roughest uh, stage of hide tanning. It's called the parfleche. It's really stiff. You don't mess around with this. It'll hurt you. Then comes the, the smoked coloring of an animal's skin. 
then the highest, like I said earlier on, is the white buckskin. This is top-notch, high tanning process. And these Indians, they knew, these First Nations, they knew how to go from this to this. The the, the 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 use of the the dogs the wolf dogs uh well I'll be honest with you um they became family friends of the family uh they were not <clears throat> they didn't go from from TP to TP to TP uh to to be friends they were uh how did they say that word they were um True only to their master, if you want to use that term. The, the young kids that took that puppy from the den, brought it to their camp, their teepee, their home, and worked with that creature until it was able to um, be hand-fed, played with, handled, and then eventually used as a beast of burden. That, that wolf dog's loyalty was to you. So you could play with the dog. You could go hunting with the dog, with the wolf dog. You could, I guess, sleep with the dog. You know, the wolf dog. But it was used mainly for the beast of burden. Does that answer your question, young man? I'm sorry, the white what? The, why did they prefer the white uh, hide? It, they didn't prefer it. They would use it as a, like, have you ever seen mom and dad dressed to the nines to go on a date? Yeah. Mom, mom puts her makeup on her jewelry and her nicest dress, and dad just combs his hair really nice. Hey? In the days of old, there were special times when they needed their special regalia. And most of it was made from this hide. Their day to day to day was this color. So there was seasonal clothing, there was special occasion clothing, and there was winter clothes, like I said, seasonal. Winter, spring, summer, for the females as well as for the males. But white buckskin was used for very special occasions. Does that answer your question? Cool. Their most valuable um what was their most valuable weapon? It depended on the individual. Some could uh, use an addle addle. Have you ever seen an addle addle? It's uh, like a spear, and you put your your. It's like a uh, how could I like a uh, what do you call that game? You use a, okay. yeah. It's that kind of a handle with a scoop at the end of it, kind of. And you put a spear on that, and you can use it to throw the spear extra 200 yards. <clears throat> um, so some were so excellent that they could use that addle addle to probably take a bird out of the tree or hit the buffalo in a certain spot on the head that would uh, kill it immediately. Uh, some were really good with their uh, bow and arrows. I tried to learn. <laughs> this is such a silly story. I tried to learn to be a, a arrow hunter, thinking my cousin and I, we 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 went to college together. And we we were uh, oh let's 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 uh, sign up for the um, arch archery class. Ah. <sighs> I still have uh, pain in this part of my wrist because I kept hitting myself with the string. And oh, did that ever hurt? 
even though I had the, the guard on, and I was thinking about it from time to time, I, how did my ancestors not, sh you know, cut themselves up with their with the with the the string, uh, the the sinew? Uh, it depended. Some were great with their obsidian knives. Uh, some were good with their with their with their stone axes. They could throw it. They'd have a handle, a uh, wooden handle tied to a stone axe like this. They could throw this. A lot of uh, hostile Hollywood movies call them tomahawks. They're stone axes. And they, 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 with the um, wooden handle tied onto it uh, with animal skin, they could throw this. And probably um, if they hit the, a deer, uh, um, maybe... Um, uh, uh, a, 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 what do you call it, a pheasant or something like that, they would uh, be able to uh, uh, one shot, one kill. You know what I'm saying? So it depended on the individual what, the, what, what they were most comfortable to um, become experts with. Does that answer your question? It's no longer flint, but it's not obsidian. No, I'm looking for the, this, what? It's, it's yeah, mineral, yeah, it's a mineral, but it is um, from, what, where does, we, we still get this, this stone, this, this, uh, this mineral. Volcanoes. Yeah, right on, Volca volcanic rock. We call it, my people call it nature's own glass. Because if you flake it off thin enough, you could see the sunlight through it. You could see, um, um, you, you could use it as a decoration for your, your buckskin outfit. But it was mainly used for your um, uh, knives, your obsidian knives, your um, arrowheads, and your spearheads. It was, it, it was easiest to work with as well. Mountain shirt itself, where's that shirt? Uh, that one or a... the, there, this one. This is my other favorite. This stone is, um, as they say, indigenous to this area, to the Blackfoot homeland uh, church. Um, obsidian was traded for. I would trade with you coming up from uh, South Dakota, I would trade with you. You'd give me your, your obsidian, and I would give you my white buckskin. Because there was no money back then. If we could go back to that way of life, I think the world would be a whole lot happier to live in. Because honest to God, I cannot see myself being a zillionaire. I wouldn't even be able to count my money. <laughs> These were the, st the minerals that the ancestors traded for, worked with, and again, they used plant and mineral, and, uh, and they, they got really good with, with, with the, the development of, and these progressed with, uh, uh, into the years. So it was, uh, uh, again, going back to what I said er 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 quite early in the, in the presentation. I am very proud to be um, a, a First Nation, a Bla especially of the Blackfoot Nation people. Those people were, oh, they were ingenious in their development and how nature taught them and the lessons they learned. Okay, I have one parting gift, verbal gift, to each and every one of you. The five L's. Look. Listen. Learn. Live. Love. Mother Earth. She will take care of us. 
Thank you for coming, everybody. Be good, stay healthy, and uh, um, first chance, if we ever have a, a, a clean world again, come back and visit and bring your family with you, bring your friends. Good luck with your education, boys and girls. Teachers, home te homeschool teachers, good luck.